Hello everyone, welcome back to the workshop. So in this video, we are going to be making a little copper hand mirror. Uh, this is a project that I made quite some time back. It was never actually for the channel, but it was for a client. And I have another order for one of those. So me and Thomas, we're gonna forge the various elements of this thing, and it ought to be a pretty fun video. And I'm gonna take you along for the ride and give you guys some little insights into what it's like as a day in the life of a blacksmith. So without further ado, let's get right into it. Okay, so here's where we are. This is what we are actually going to be replicating today. Um, again, I made this copper, I made this copper hand mirror about eight or so years ago. Um, and so uh, my skills have obviously progressed quite a bit since then. And so that kind of does make a project like this a little bit challenging when you're called upon to make something that you did oh so many years ago or almost a decade now ago. Um, but this, this mirror, uh, it sold on the website. I forgot to take it down actually after I originally sold this mirror and that's what's led to a another mirror being sold that I need to replicate. In this case, we're actually going to be adapting this and making it about 15% larger than where it was pri uh, previously of the previous one that we made. Um, but you can get a good idea or a good sense of what we're going for here. Thomas is going to be working on this. I'm going to do some filming uh, with him. This is a great this is a great place to add if you have another guy working in your shop. Uh, this is a great apprentice thing that you can have an apprentice do, um, especially when it's been so long ago. You can help guide through the steps and it doesn't require, you know, super finesse detail. But I'm going to go ahead and have Thomas actually forge this portion here, um, the actual handle. So I'm actually going to have him forge this handle portion here with this little T place there. I'm going to film that and guide Thomas along that process. I'm actually going to forge this little taco shape piece here that actually retains the copper mirror itself. And then Thomas is going to do the polishing work uh, on the mirror, on the actual copper mirror blank. And we'll walk through some of that and uh, some tips I have for you to turn this, you know, into a more of a mirror finish. Uh, but as you can see, we've got, we took really good detailed photos, which is great of this project when I had made it originally. And uh, so, you know, that's really helpful. And also we have the previous listing where we have all of the measurements and things that it was, it, it's finished uh, weight measurements and stuff like that. So that is really helpful uh, if you add that in on anything that you're making. If you're not making stuff to sell, or even if you are, make sure you keep a ledger where you have some of this information because you never know when you're called upon to take and make something again. I'll go over a couple more little sheets here. A couple different details. Again, high quality images of all the important parts. This here was a polished in, made, a sh made sure it polished. This is also something to be looking at as, as you're going forward. This is for the memory banks. You know, how did I do each one of these steps? Well, photos are worth a thousand words. So you can tell here that this is the same cross section width here, but it tapers asymmetrically down to the actual mirror end. And then also you can see that the corner has been relieved via a chamfer. So those are the key elements that we're gonna to try to break this thing down into and make sure that we copy exact or as close to exact as we can, and then go on through there. Again, noticing the key features, copper mirror, check, three rivets, check, banana shape, uh, you know, boat thing, retainer, whatever you want to call it, check, two scrolls, two little scrolly ends or little rat tails on the ends of the mirror, check, right, same width, same width or thickness as the parent bar, but then tapering down on the top and bottom. And uh, so with all that information, we're ready to get started and uh, take you guys along for this ride. Okay, the starting size of this handle material that we're gonna start with is this is a 10 inch long piece of 5 8 inch square. Um, so that's, that's gonna be the starting point of this. The previous mirror, I believe, was half inch square bar. Uh, but again, we're making it a bit larger, and so we need a handle that's going to be propo proportionate in the long run. So we're going to start with 10 inches of material for Thomas's end of starting to forge this handle.
everyone. In this initial step, what Thomas is doing is we are looking for this asymmetrical taper. We're not looking for a symmetrical taper. In one way, it's going to be symmetrical from the as viewed from the side, but as it's viewed from the top and bottom, it will be it'll be pretty much an asymmetrical taper. So what I mean by that is we're all pulling it down, or it's going to be a flat taper. Maybe that's a better way of explaining it. So we are reducing its cross-section thickness, since this being a square bar, on the top and bottom. We are reducing that while trying to maintain the same original parent bar stock's thickness along its width. So that is what we're aiming for. And we're going to be aiming to reduce this all the way down to half of its original parent bar thickness. So roughly about 5 sixteenths of an inch is what we're looking for. One of the things you see Thomas doing currently is you see Thomas using the cross peen of his hammer uh, versus the flat face and the horn of the anvil. And what we're trying to accomplish with that is not only a more rapid foolering action on the piece, but we are also taking and looking to achieve more stretch in the piece and less spread. So this is a very rapid way of keeping and maintaining your parent bar stock thickness or, or your width while reducing its thickness in one plane. And so that's what Thomas is working on right now doing. Now, when you see him coming down into these darker heats, all he's doing is planishing up what he did in that heat. I personally, I like to, unless I'm really close to where I need to be, I like to just get it back in the fire and get it hot and keep working it, um, you know, keep working it while hot and getting it closer and then finally come down to that final planishing heat, clean everything up. Okay, so Thomas has got the taper completely established now, uh, which is a good thing. Um, so obviously that's what we're shooting for. So he has that taper all the way fully established. And now what he's doing is he's working on putting some eighth inch, roughly eighth inch across, maybe just a touch less um, flat on the corners. Now that helps round off those corners a little bit for this hand mirror. And it helps increase the kind of rustic aesthetic uh, that we're going for with this particular hand mirror uh, to add that little bit of corner texture if you will. It'll really help sell it when we go to the finishing steps later and we sand the highs and get those to kind of pop out through uh, to give it some extra show. So you'll see that later on in the video once we actually get to the finishing thing. So if uh, Thomas, can you go ahead and rotate it real quick for me? T rotate the taper to the camera. So, so nope, keep it down on the anvil like you were. And just rotate, yeah, there you go, that's perfect. So you guys can see how that's a really long, nice, even taper is what we're looking for, but it's only from one side. And he maintained the same parent bar thickness throughout, or the width of the original parent bar uh, thickness. So that's really what we were looking for. And he used a pair of uh, you know, calipers to check it as you go down through there. These are just some forged calipers. I'll leave a link to that video uh, down in the description um, that I made so many years ago on the actually forging this set of uh, calipers. You can bring those and show those back up. These are real simple to make. Uh, in fact, I forged these out of some quarter by one flat bar stock, one single rivet. These I made really big to be able to get inside um, you know, like specialized areas. Uh, I made them really big and, and, you know, and really it's all about a tension joint. So they're just like a slip joint caliper, uh, but you can measure little changes or really big bar stock with it. Um, so yeah, works out pretty good. Okay, so this piece is now fully cooled down. And what we've done is we've marked a line about three inches in from the end of the bar. Um, now this is the thin, thinly tapered portion of the bar. So if you turn it, Thomas, real quick, you could, so everybody can see. Um, 
yeah, so this is the thin end of the bar. This is what will be going up close to the mirror. So we went ahead and marked about a three inch mark down, and then we used a center finder uh, scribe to find the center line of this, uh, you know, of this bar, and went ahead and scribed it out. Now Thomas is going to use the bandsaw here, and he's going to go ahead and split this. Now you all can do whatever you like here. I know some people will say, well, hey, you know, you ought to be talented enough to take and use a chisel and split this. And it has been my experience that if you have the ability to a vertical bandsaw, to use a vertical bandsaw, it is much more accurate and therefore will create a much cleaner, nicer product. Not Okay, so there you go. You can see how accurately you can cut a line, keep it on dead center, and that's really what we're after, um, you know, with a bandsaw. So that took all of about two minutes uh, to cut that. First step in this process, this is just like any sort of squirrel cooker or any type of uh, forks, grilling forks or things that you might do. We're going to take and go ahead and open up this cut using a nice long slitting chisel. We're trying to open it all the way down to that nice three inch mark or get pretty close. And then we're going to work the chisel to the left and right to get this thing spread out a little bit more, hopefully without any galling. That's good enough, Thomas. We're going to open that up more later. As you can see, a good sharp edge in the anvil is a great way of opening up a split like that. And now Thomas is going to try to take and create, instead of like a barbecue roasting fork, what we're trying to accomplish instead is we're trying to create that same asymmetrical taper that we did for the handle, but now we are doing it in the plane like you see it. So we're gonna thin it in the top and down direction that Thomas was just working on. And then like he is right now, we're gonna correct the parent bar thickness as we thin that down for our little rat's tail, our little scrolly in. So this doesn't take a lot of heat to get this done. This is actually a pretty uh, you know, quick process and it's probably the e easiest portion of this whole process as far as physically demanding. You really want to back off, lay off the mustard, you know, you don't want to just whale things at this stage. This is as we keep completing various little elements as we go along, we have to slowly but surely get a little more finessey with our forging as that project comes to a completion. So that's what we're looking for. We start off with heavy forging, to get close to our shape. And then as we are close, get closer and closer to our shapes and our final dimensions, that's when we let off the gas pedal a little bit and start getting a little more finessey with it uh, to just kind of ease it in. Okay, Thomas has these tines drawn out now, both sides, which are gonna become these scrolls uh, on each side of the mirror. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna dress out the saw cut. We're gonna do that by going over the horn of the anvil, and we're going to upset uh, basically the crotch of the pants here that we have created in the steel. So he's gonna do that by holding the bar vertically. Go ahead and bring it out, Thomas, if you can. Get it out. 
As localized heat as you can is great. This is where coal would be a little bit more superior in this situation. But now we're gonna use the, the horn of the anvil to go ahead and dress out the uh, crotch of that cut. So we're gonna dress that saw cut out to where it's completely flat. Take out any unnecessary bending. And as he does this, uh, one pro tip for you, as he does this, you'll notice how the, basically the tines of this are rolled forward, almost like a pair of bull horns. He's gonna have to keep adjusting those forward, so this way we can get through the opening of the gas forge. Here again is another place where a coal forge is just a tiny bit more superior in the usability aspect of it. Not only can you get a smaller localized heat, but you don't have to worry about your, you know, the, the tines on it necessarily being able to fit through the opening of the forge. So if you work with a small forge, you gotta do what you gotta do. You have to give yourself some conveniency bins. Now these are later on gonna be obviously not its shape. We're just doing that as a conveniency to be able to fit it through the front opening of this forge. Okay, so Tom is gonna pull this thing out again and continue to work with it here. One thing he is going to do is he's gonna go over the slack tub and go ahead and quench off some of that excess handle material there uh, that we don't need to take and have affecting our upset because we don't need this whole thing to shorten. We just really need to localize that area at the saw cut uh, to be able to get that nice and flat across. So, so that's what he's gonna do with that real quick. And then he's gonna continue his hammering process. Uh, one thing I'd like to point out as he's doing this, you do not want to rush this process. Take your time and get a nice smooth, you know, get it nice and smooth across there. It's gonna take a few heats to do this and that's perfectly okay and that's what you want. Generally speaking, the hotter you can keep this at this stage while doing this, the more readily it will move. But we don't want to create, the biggest thing we don't want to create is stress risers on either side of that, on the outsides of our handle there. So we don't want those things to fold back or collapse in and create little hot shuts or little cold shuts later on in the piece. That can end up cracking on us. So get it hot, take your time, and slowly upset this material back into place. Okay, so I just so happen to have a five inch uh, disc that, that I had on hand from a bending jig. So Thomas is gonna use that as a guide. He's gonna dress over the anvil first, hopefully. Get those things in angle. <laughs> Just get the shape rough on the anvil horn. Now, one of the troubles of working over the anvil horn, although you can get it pretty much round and symmetrical, is that it's a conical shape, so it's a cone. So you can't exactly just forge things right flat to it. So if you can have an appropriate inside diameter piece, whether it be three inch, five inch, 10 inch, whatever, a big piece of pipe or a large bar cross section that you can make sure that it's accurate to and that you can forge flat up against to make sure that everything's square, that will really help and aid in a process like this. Um, so he, he's noticed he kind of started hitting on one edge because it probably had a tiny bit of a twist to it. Again, having something like this really helps you out in the long run, figure out where things need to be hit to get everything flat and corrected. All right, as you can see, we got the disc upright. Now Thomas is gonna go ahead and scroll up that little, scroll up that little end there. And do the little bit of a rat's tail on there. You want to get it a little tighter on the interior there, Thomas. So we we'll probably have to go for a little. Heat. We'll, we'll have to go for another heat on that. That way you don't eat up too much material. But you can see, if you hold that back down, Thomas, in front of the deal there. Show both legs. Show both legs. There you go to the camera. Angle them to the camera. You can see how much material one of those little rat's tails on the end take up. They take up approximately three quarters to an inch and a quarter of material, depending on how tight you roll them up. So on this particular wrap, we are not wrapping it very far, about like what he has it right there, where basically it points back skyward. 
um, is what we're looking for. So where the end rolls back on itself, and then if you look at it right there, it's basically pointing straight down at the ground, and that's about what it was on the original, and that's kind of what we're looking for now. So can we turn that back flat towards the camera? There you go, so they can see there. Yeah, perfect. Something like that. That's kind of what we're going for. Obviously, we will have to now, as you pull on this to scroll this up, it's going to flatten out that curve a bit, and we'll end up adjusting that later on once we have that taco piece installed. So now Thomas is going to do the other side, and then we will be on to the taco piece. All right, so now we are into forging the mirror retainment device, or the taco <laughs> for short. So now we're gonna go ahead and forge this bit of a metal taco. Now this is a bit interesting. So I've chosen to use angle iron. Now you could use just flat bar stock and put a crease in the center of it and fold it up like a taco. Uh, either way, plenty applicable and fine. This particular angle iron is three quarter inch across this face here by three quarter inch. Uh, it's just what I had on hand and it works out and it'll be appropriate for what we're making. The one that I had previously, I believe I just took regular uh, one inch bar stock and I folded it in two. So it was like eighth by one and I folded it in two to take and make my taco, which gave me a little less than a half inch on the sides. And if I remember correctly, again, eight years ago or so, uh, I didn't like that. I wish I would have had a little bit more and, uh, and I also didn't know this trick that I'm about to take and show you to turn this into a taco. So I have this on a very long bar. Part of that is because of that gas forge has a lot of dragon's breath. I don't like to get real close. And the other portion of it is now I have a long lever that I can use to lever against as I form this end. And then I'll cut it off to the exact length that I need after I get the shape I'm after. So I will go ahead and heat this end up and we are going to start collapsing this down. And I have a few pro tips to take and share with you on doing this type of work whenever you're working with something like this, like a bit of channel that you don't want to collapse up. Okay, I got this thing nice and warmed up now. And now what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and hammer both sides evenly for a specific length. Now, what that length is, well, just whatever I feel like at the moment. So. Right now, we're not going to be too concerned because really, at this point, all we're doing is making bar, uh, basically making up a bit of bar stock or a bit more material we can work with. So we're creating this, turning this basically into a channel. So I'm going to work nice and evenly both sides. If you don't work both sides as you're folding this closed, one side will get a little longer than the other, and that's bad. We don't want that, right? We want these to be nice and even. We don't want to have a high side and a short side. So I'm going to go ahead and close this down, and now I'm going to show you the secret sauce to this, uh, to this equation. So if you notice that this is open, and we need it to be open for us to be able to fit our mirror material in, but if we leave this open like this, while we go to form this material around, form this around this horn, okay, to get our curvature, to get our correct radii, what's going to happen is, is the, that gap there is going to increase. So these edges, bring, bring out Mr. Thing here, these edges here on the inside of our taco are trying to compress while the outside edge, singular edge, is trying to stretch. So you can stretch things in blacksmithing a lot easier than what you can compress things. So what happens is, is that outside moves very readily around where the inside says, nope, don't wanna go. And so what happens is, is it travels in the path of least resistance, all your force you're putting into it, and it goes into opening the taco. That's not what we want. So the way we counteract this is by closing up this seam and getting both of these parallel together. So this way it's almost like we have two bits of material that are three quarter inch by eighth being bent edgeways or the hard way. And that way when we bend it around, we can make this full bend and we don't have to worry about the taco opening up. 
then we can drive in a wedge a little later and we can open this back up to where we need it to be after it's been bent. So that's what we're gonna do. So this is, still, this is a little cold right now, but I'm gonna go ahead and close up this taco because I can. I'm gonna get it back in the forge and I'm gonna get it one more heat on this and get it, really get it evened up in the next heat. I'm gonna go ahead and get that closed up and evened up the rest away in the next heat and then we'll get her bent at the same time. Dropped it. Magnet to the rescue. Okay, so now that I've got Thomas's help, I'm gonna have him bring out this piece here. Uh, if you don't have help, you can just do this in the vise. It just takes a little longer. But I'm gonna make use of the help because I'm fortunate enough to have a good friend here to help me. Good apprentice. So I'm just gonna open up this taco a little bit at a time. Let's go back this way a little bit, Thomas, over here. Bring it over this way, there you go. All right, roll it back down. There you go, keep going, roll it. Now we're not trying to go all the way to the bottom, we're not trying to cut anything, we're just trying to use this to split open this piece. So, and we're probably gonna end up, we're probably right at that limit where we need to flip it around and we probably need to get another heat on this. So you do want this to be kind of hot when we do this. I'll show this off real quick, let me see that, let me see those tongs. I'm gonna show this off, hopefully, in a way that'll make sense. So can you guys see that? I've opened that pocket up now. And we're gonna open it up a little wider yet. And we're gonna open it up and then we're gonna use this. I've got another blank here. And if you're curious in this video where you can find blanks like what I'm using for this copper mirror and like I'm about to use for this shim, you can find blanks like this and a whole lot more over at our website, www.blacksmithingblanks.com. Um, that's how we support the channel around here. It's through our blanks and Thomas's really hard work there in the CNC side of the shop as well uh, to take and be able to support all the great content that you're viewing here on YouTube. So please be, consider uh, 
checking out our store on that. So uh, as you can see, we're gonna use this. This is like a four inch diameter, little 16 gauge uh, blank. This is the same thickness that that copper is. And we're gonna take and do that. And that's how we're gonna use that as a, uh, we're gonna drive this down onto that piece. And that will give us our correct spacing that we need. So now we're gonna go ahead and heat this back up. And we're gonna open up the rest of this kind of taco and just kind of get it all nice and open before we set the final depth. All right, out we go. Continue, gonna take it over here. Uh, we're gonna continue to open this up, just like so. Slow up. Too, went too far there. We're just aiming to open this slot up all the way to the bottom of our previous without cutting in. We just want to open the slot all the way to the bottom of that original angle iron is what we're looking for. Now, some of you may have noticed I'm using a curved slitting chisel. That is so my ends don't dig in where they're not supposed to and I can get that chisel all the way to bottom without making cuts in this piece. Now, none of this really matters because you're never gonna see it but we just don't want to cut the piece in two or create any stress risers. That's going to make us have to go back and redo our work. Um, we, we don't want that. There we go. So now we got the piece all opened up here. Thank you, Thomas. So now we got our piece all opened up and we're ready in the next heat to close it down on top of our disc here to get our final form and shape for our mirror. So I'm super excited about that. This looks really hot on camera. It is not that hot in real life. Uh, the camera settings need to be adjusted just a little bit there. But now I'm gonna go ahead and use this, put this in, make sure it's tight and close it down. Just like before, I want it to be tight on all edges. So, or I want the edges to be even. I don't want a high side and a low side. So I'm gonna work both sides of this equation. There we go, we got that pretty well adjusted to that blank. Now this is gonna take a little bit of a trick to pull out uh, and get hammered off of here. Uh, I'll have to clamp this portion in the vise and get a, get a punch and punch this up and off of this blank. Um, and as you can tell, this is a much smaller blank than what we are going for. This is a much smaller blank than our mirror. Now if I would have had a similar size blank to the mirror um, in, instead of copper, but have that in steel, that would have been more ideal. But when we drive this off, I will restretch this over the horn just a little bit, and then I'll have all of my dimensions down, and we will be ready for assembly work. But now the next stage in this process, at least for us anyhow, is to go ahead and get that mirror polished, uh, get that copper blank polished up into a mirror, and then finally start bringing this whole thing together for assembly. Um, so that's where we'll be at next, is over in the finishing shop. Okay, so we're getting ready to get started to go ahead and polish this copper up. Now I'm going to give a couple quick tips here of how I like to go about the system and the method that I like to do to get a nice mirror finish on copper. Now in this particular case, I like to use a 300 grit sandpaper. 
and this I have a orbital sander. Now the orbital sander I'm using, again, not a sponsor of this channel in any way, shape, or form, is this Bosch orbital sander. Uh, it's got a nice variable speed selector switch on it, which makes it really nice. And you can also hook a vacuum up to it, which is uh, pretty slick uh, to be able to do that. Um, but for working on flat pieces like this that don't have any curvature to them and don't have a whole lot of you know damage for big gouges or anything else like that in it, a orbital sander is great. Barring that, if Thomas, will you go grab that pad over there real quick to show that that goes on a that goes on an angle grinder. Consequently, say if you don't want to get an orbital sander, you can use one of these. This is a backing pad. Uh, it's got like a foam pad to it. This particular one I picked up at the old Harbor Freight, so it's pretty cheap uh, to get these. And then these are a, uh, I believe they are a Diablo brand. I believe it is what it is. Um, these are just from your local Home Depot or hardware store, yeah. So that's a 320 grit sandpaper that I'm using. And again, this is made for orbital sanders, but works out well on one of these backing pads so you can put it on an angle grinder. I use this for any curved surfaces or if I've really got to dig out a, a gnarly, you know, say you're using a bit of used pipe, if you got a big gore mark or something in it, um, these are really great for taking that out. Since this is a plasma cut blank that came from a brand new sheet from us, again, you can find these over at our website, www.blacksmithingblanks.com. Since these are one of, uh, you know, those type blanks, they're really smooth right off the gate. So we don't have to do too much to this to get it polished. Word of safety. As you can see, my fine friend here, Thomas, he is wearing a VersaFlow. Now you can just have a regular mask and he's wearing, you know, a regular respirator uh, would be fine. But this is a particular cheap option that we came up with where we bought a 3M VersaFlow hood. It's just the hood itself. And I paired it with a Amazon blower filter. Um, I will put a link to these. Those will be affiliate Amazon affiliate links down in the description down below to this exact thing I've got. And if you're really interested in me doing a video on this in the future, let me know. And I'll do a whole video on this whole get up here um, to make your grinding a lot more comfortable. But that's what we use in the shop for copper. The reason for that being is when we grind this copper, it's gonna put off some really fine dust particulates. And I do mean fine, like powder fine. And that can get in your lungs. And when it settles in your lungs, uh, it's bad juju. Um, it can be all over for you. Because if you look at this sleeve, uh, it turns all verdigris, which is poisonous to humans there. That's what it does inside your lungs. Uh, so definitely suit up if you're going to work with copper. It's not like it's going to just kill you on the first day, but it's an accumulative effect. So you definitely wear your respiration. Um, it is much needed. So over here, we've already got this piece welded up. I went ahead and skipped ahead. This is just an arc weld. I just prepped the joint and put a little one inch arc weld across these and then went ahead and dressed that up with a angle grinder. Not much to see there. Uh, we do also have a mark where we need to take and saw this off. We left ourselves enough extra that now we know exactly where we need to take and cut the excess off of the bar to get the right amount of shape and size and scale that we're looking for. We've also cleaned up the interior groove of this. I took a, on an angle grinder, I took a zip disc and I cleaned out the groove a little bit of any crud or rust or otherwise that was down in there to allow that blank, that copper blank to slip in there a lot easier. So without further ado, Thomas is gonna go ahead and get to uh, grinding on this. And as he does so, I will be inside my helmet doing a little bit of instructional and share some more tips with you. Okay, so as Thomas goes ahead and grinds this real quick, I want to take and give you guys a couple little pieces of advice about sandpaper and grinding, um, you know, copper or any of your metal finishes. So it's really common because of how expensive this type stuff is, right? For how expensive these are on the shelf, 
that you try to take and soak out. I know I've done it, you know, many a times, but you try to soak every last penny out of, of use out of that thing. But when you're doing fine finishes, you really need to take and use the pads until you feel like they're just really not cutting it anymore and you need to change the pad right then and there. Uh, they, do ha they do wear out a lot faster when you're grinding metal than something like maybe if you're gr grinding wood. Just like wood, when you're grinding metal, the disc packs up with some of that metal dust and um, that is bad and that's going to lead to unsatisfactory results as you're grinding. So change your pads often. Now, does that mean you got to chuck those pads and never use them again? No. Set them as a used discard, have a discard pile have a used pile and have a brand new pile of pads. That way you can select them just like grinding belts on a 2x72 uh, belt grinder. You can use what's appropriate for the job. If you just need to do some rough grinding, go to your used, uh, you know, your used pile before you throw them out in the discard pile. And then if you have something like fine finish work to do, that's where you grab your new pile. So as Thomas is grinding on this, this is getting way, way shinier. And this is what I love about an orbital sander on flat planes like this. It's almost getting to a mere finish. You can almost, you can see the reflection in it now. So just imagine how that's gonna look when we buff that thing up and really give it the fine polish over on our buffer. It's gonna be really, really nice. So now I'm gonna go ahead and tap Thomas tell him to put on a new pad. So I'm gonna have him go ahead and put on a new pad and uh, and just set that aside. Again, if you look at this, this doesn't look that wore out, but where he's pressing at, there's a noticeable, there's a noticeable difference. You can almost see a ring there. You can see where it's a lot coarser here and then where he's been making contact, it's almost, almost all the grit's gone on that. So you can see how quickly you're gonna go through these when you're doing fine finish work but it's really important for you to take and chuck that pad off the side. That's not a discard, it's not to get rid of. We're just gonna set it aside for other projects and we're gonna come in here and we're gonna use a new pad that's gonna give us more, more of the grinding and sanding action we need uh, to get it a lot, lot smoother. Okay. So, Thomas has been going for a little while now, and hopefully you guys can see how shiny that is. That's where we're heading. We want that to be nice, and we want it to be like that on both sides. So you can see how it started off, and where it's ending up. So this right here is a pre-finished condition, so this is really well done, ready to go, to actually be buffed and polished. And you can almost see a little bit of that reflection in it. And that's what you want to see, and that's kind of how you know that you're about done um, and ready to go on to the next step. So now Tom's going to go ahead and polish and do the same sanding on the back side as he did the front side and get it as clean as he can, and then we will go over to the buffer and uh, really make this thing shine. So we have this piece all ready to go, looking jazzy, looking flashy. You can see a reflection in it, which makes it look so nice, so nice. You can see me, hello me in that. Um, so that's how you know that you've got it sanded well enough to take and go on to your buffing and polishing stage. Now, if you notice, I am handling this at this stage with a pair of gloves. Now, these are just a pair of nitrile gloves, and I'm doing that to keep my oils and my sweat off of this copper because it will tarnish that copper and it will leave a thumbprint or residue on there later on uh, unless you acetone this thing heavily and get all of your oils off of it. So keep this in mind. Now, on the subject of gloves and buffing. So here's a Baldor buffer. This is my main buffer. It has been for many, many, many years. Um, and this thing is like the basically the gigantic wheel of death. This will swing around a 10 inch buffing wheel uh, on it and it will do it at over 3600 RPMs. So it is not something to be trifled with. That being said, and because this is gonna come up in conversation, gloves while operating machinery. 
if you talk to a machinist, a machinist will tell you, never wear gloves while operating machinery. If you talk to somebody who polishes copper for a living, they will tell you, wear gloves while operating machinery. You need to be aware of what the, why that is. So, generally speaking, wearing gloves or long sleeves or anything that can snag, catch, or otherwise intertwine you with a spinning shaft, a piece of machinery, is a bad thing. You're going to have a very bad day. That can't be disputed at all. These machines have plenty of torque, and this thing, if it grabs you, it will crawl right up on you and ruin your day. However, if you do not wear protection on your hands while polishing copper on that spinning wheel of death over there, you are going to burn these little digits right off. The friction heat that comes off the copper on that machine will absolutely smoke your fingers. Um, this will get hot. Even with wearing gloves on a long polishing session, a, to get the buff in there, even wearing gloves, you will get uncomfortably hot polishing and buffing the copper because you're holding it against this wheel that's creating a ton of friction. And I've gotten the copper so hot that it literally fries water. So water will boil off on the surface just by buffing. So before everybody comes at me in the comment section about wearing gloves or Thomas wearing gloves at the buffing wheel, I want to see your fingers after a buffing session without gloves when polishing copper. More power to you. We are professionals and this is what a professional will do. Now there's two different types of options here. This here is a tight fitting glove. This is preferred. This has a leather palm. It provides a little bit better protection or you never want to wear anything like a rubber glove or a nitrile glove. Again, it will melt to your skin polishing the copper. We are, this is a leather palm glove and this will get hot pretty quick. Thomas will have to take multiple breaks in the polishing process, depending on how much of a man he is or if he's a crybaby, but we shall find out. This other option has one of these gloves stuffed in a much heavier leather welding glove. Now, this is less preferred. This up here is less preferred. It would be better if this cinched up nice and tight because it's the looseness of this that can grab and pull you into machinery. Again, keep your arms out of it. Don't hug the spinning drive shaft on a buffer. So Thomas is, you know, again, Thomas, this will just tuck back. He'll be fine. He's only going to be out here towards the tips of his fingers. So you can see this glove has seen a lot, and I do mean a lot of polishing and buffing of copper. Um, but this keeps you protected when working with copper at the buffer. So without further ado, Tom's gonna finish getting suited up here and he's gonna get to polishing this thing. While Thomas polishes this piece up, I'm going to talk a little bit more about this little setup I've got for this VersaFlow. As you see, that takes uh, this is a little adapter kit I bought um, for this cheap Chinese uh, blower uh, thing um, to take smaller, like painter or dust cover mass uh, type things versus really big canister charcoal canisters that this thing originally came with. Um, and that's to increase the airflow through. And plus, this is a good enough dust filter for what we're doing and the particulate matter that we're working with. But you can see that it has a hose here that continues all the way up, has an extension, and it goes all the way up to the top of Thomas's head here. Now, this is a 3M, again, not a sponsor of the channel. This is an actual VersaFlow hood, but I bought this separate and it was for a really good deal. Um, and I can't say enough about this. These really, really work and really, really put out a lot of airflow. 
I want to say that this pump at the time when I purchased it was right around $100. And the helmet there was about 300 bucks. So I'm in a full VersaFlow system for about $400, just, just right around there about. So the model number of that VersaFlow hood is a VersaFlow M200. That's what the model of this hood is. Uh, one thing I did have to do is I had to make an adapter up here at the top of Thomas's head. Uh, it had a, a pipe come off. This had one of these crank on type deals and I had to take that off and then basically stretch the tube over the top there. Um, and But that got us back in order. Now the runtime on these things have been amazing. Um, Thomas can go a whole day cutting copper, uh, easy peasy, uh, without having to change, uh, without having to charge up the battery. And the battery's just a 12 volt DC plug that you can plug in and then charge it right up. It's a pretty handy, handy system. As you can see, Thomas is keeping his hands away from the things that matter. Now, I may look from perspective point that he's a lot closer than what he is in the camera just because of the way the camera is at. But you can see he's starting to really get that nice polish on there. But with that much friction that's going on there right now, that thing is screaming hot. And this is where I say you need to consider stuff on application when it comes to gloves or no gloves you need to consider the application that you're using it for generally speaking if you're taking and wearing gloves around a drill press that's a no-no if you're wearing gloves you know basically around a wire wheel that's a no-no right if you're wearing gloves around a lathe that's a no-no Pretty much almost every spinning shaft that's out there has the potential to harm you or hurt you. But in this case, it's a necessary risk you have to take in order to get the polish and the buffing on the copper um, if you're doing it by hand. There's really no other way. The only real way that you can do anything different on this is if you had something to mechanically hold that copper disc, like a vacuum or something, like a vacuum table, and you brought the buffer to the surface, and that would probably be the safest way. But if you're gonna use a regular hand buffer to really polish out stuff like this, it's gonna get screaming hot, and unfortunately, you do have to take the extra risk of having the gloves. Okay, and here we have it. This is all perfectly polished here. Uh, or as polished as it's going to be for about a mere finish. As you can see, that looks really, really nice. So the next step is we actually have to get this attached now to our mirror frame. The way we're going to do that is we are going to use this wire. This is a ground wire. Uh, don't start me to lying what type of gauge this is, but this is a ground wire that they use to ground homes with or lightning rods. And uh, you can find this, you could ask this, from like maybe one of your local electricians, see if they've got a little tiny scrap bundle they wouldn't mind selling you. This makes a lot of rivets and makes pretty good rivets. Only downside is, is this is pretty tough or pretty hard stuff when you get it. Uh, so it's not very soft. So to make a really good rivet out of it, you do need to take a little bit off and you need to go ahead and anneal the copper. To anneal the copper, you bring this up to a nice bright orange heat and quench it in water, and that should soften the copper sufficiently that it'll make a really nice rivet for you. Uh, but this is roughly about 3 16 to quarter inch, um, you know, in diameter, and that's what we're going to use as our rivets on this copper mirror. So now the next step in this process, I'll take you out to the steel portion out here in the other side of the shop. Excuse the mess, if you will. Excuse the mess wherever that mirror went to. There it is, fell off my anvil. So now the next step in this process, we are actually going to go ahead and drill the holes. We're gonna pre-drill the holes in the steel portion of this, get them laid out, uh, get them laid out where they need to be. We already did some checking test fits with the copper before we polished it. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and drill those holes. We'll get back to you after we have those holes drilled and we will actually work on finishing this, blending our weld in by putting it back in the forge and getting some scale on there. And we gotta finish this out before we go ahead and drill our holes for our, uh, you know, drill our holes into our copper and affix it to that. Because uh, the handle has basically has to be finished by the time we actually put the copper rivets in. So we'll go, I'll be back with you after we get these holes drilled and we're ready to put the finish on this handle 
and then put this whole thing together. Okay, as you can see, we got this pretty hot. Um, you know, like I said, that bright orange, you know, bright yellow somewhere in there. A uh, big thing you want to watch is that you don't collapse your taco by gripping it that way. And then uh, as this cools down, again, this is at the scaling heat, this is where you can work the whole piece over. So this is where it's beneficial that you can work this whole entire piece over with the wire wheel now and uh, get a really nice, smooth, even finish. Makes it look really nice. All right, Thomas, go ahead and show that off to the camera there so everybody can see it really well. Hold it down where everybody can see. There you go. So again, it gives it a nice sheeny, you know, nice finish there. Uh, it brightens the finish slightly. And obviously you get those kind of those blue temper colors that start coming through. Uh, when you do a wire wheel like this, you kind of get that blued uh, look to it, which looks really, really sharp whenever you spray on that clear lacquer or that clear urethane finish. Um, and so now this is ready. Effectively, once it cools down, we are ready to assemble the copper mirror to this. So we will. All right. So now what I'm doing is, is I'm just highlighting my edges. We got that wire wheeling done. It's got that nice little blue color to it. And what I'm hope, what I'm doing with this sandpaper is I'm trying to make sure that I don't rub the sandpaper in the flats or pull it taunt enough that it hits the flats of the piece. I'm just trying to highlight my edges because that really, 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 really pops when it goes into paint. So um, that really gives that contrast between dark and light, which is a very effective tool to bring contrast to your work. Not always is it appropriate, but in this particular piece, it works. Brings a lot of interest and dynamics. Dynam All right, now for the culmination of our work. So we went ahead and drilled all the holes in the copper piece along with the, uh, you, you know, this was pre-drilled where we were taking the copper to, and then we've slipped the copper piece in and we, are, and we drilled all of our holes. So we drilled a hole and then I put a pin in it and drill a hole, put a pin in it, drill another hole. So make sure that, you know, all the holes line up are good. Now, since all the holes are drilled already, we're gonna have to make sure we keep the pins in the other holes as we are peening up one. So as you peen up a hole, you have to make sure that the pins are in the other two holes to stop this thing from shifting as that uh, rivet uh, swells up. So, so we don't want that to ha happen to us. So we have to make sure that we at least put a pin or a bolt, either or, in the remaining holes so this way they, they do not have a problem. Now for this particular case, we're gonna go I'm going to set this down close to the anvil surface. Just find a place where that rivet is nice and even. Get it through there, Ivan. Get it through there. Yeah. Thomas. <laughs> Called you Ivan there for a mm -hmm. second. So, so now that we've got those in there, I'm just going to balance this, and Thomas is going to do a slight tappity tap on the center one to start getting it set. Whoa. Now he's going to go out to the one close to the camera. A little harder there. Good. And now finally the last one. All right. So now those are all set. Now on the one side of this mirror, they're down, they're out a little further. So what we have to do is we have to go over the edge of the anvil and we're going to drive those back a little bit to even them up. Well, here, let me see it, Thomas. I'm gonna take it up here and find it where I can get it pushed through a little bit better. If you're just a skosh over, this is how you push it back. 
as long as you haven't riveted too far, you can even up the rivet after the fact. And the whole time I'm doing this, I'm paying attention to where my, <laughs> where that copper's at, because I don't want to do a bunch of scratching of it. You can see how mere finish that is. Look at that hammer in there. It's fun. So anyways, that, that's a cool shot. That would have been yeah. a cool shot for a thumbnail. So now we're gonna go ahead and rivet this up. Flip it over. And all I'm looking for is just a nice even rivet head. Just like so. And that there is a copper mirror. All done. What do you think about that, Thomas? Was that a fun thing? This was a lot of fun. I had a blast with it and, uh, you know, learned a lot on it. Got to do some polishing and stuff like that. So definitely uh, want to make a few more. Yeah, be a lot of fun. Oh man, see, I'm trying to, now yeah. I'm looking at all the mirror. Yeah. Isn't that cool? Right there. There you go. Wrong way. There we go. Da da da. It is, in fact, a mirror. <laughs> so that's it for today. Um, thank you all so much for watching. I know this was kind of a long one, but this is a, this is kind of videos I enjoy doing where I get to explain uh, quite a few things and I get to help you all out there. So no matter what you're out there doing, uh, do it to the best of your ability and uh, we'll catch you on the next one. Thank you all so much for watching.